What's up, everybody? Good to have you all here. I know that you are on the road, on the go. You're cooking dinner or consuming something. If you're taking the time to be here with me tonight, I'm grateful that you are. I'm super happy to be in your life, in your world at this time because you chose to be. Big shout out to those who are on the road like Aaron Dunn, folks who are making things work because they work them like Ken Cliniff Takis. Safe travels, my friend. It's good to have you, Vincent, in Vienna. It's great to have you, Marlene. It's great to have a good number of our friends from around the world, from Adele to Anton. It's great to see you, and Willa. Good to see you, Bob and Kathy, Danielle and Dario. It's great to have Kev, Kimberly, Latish. It's good to have Richard, two Richards, including me. That's three. That's Rich Cubed. But it's great to have all the Richards in the house. Rose, Sam, Vicky, what's going on? Uh, and all those who are going to be watching the recording, it's great to have you here. What's up, Phil Mills? Good to have you, Maureen and Rose. Great to have you guys. I love these conversations, and more importantly, because the biggest part of getting more in life is really a function of conversation. So for those who are new and fresh to my world, welcome. I'm Richard Dolan, and I'm delighted to be your host for the next 49 minutes. We're going to have a conversation to elevate your relationship to what I've come to call a rich life. And there's a lot of talk about Rich. After all, that is my name. And it is Richard. So I use Rich as short. I mean, I got to be honest with you. When I was a kid growing up, people used to call me Richie Rich. If you're old like me, you might recall Richie Rich. He was blonde hair and had a dog named Dollar. And I hated being called Richie Rich. And number one reason, I didn't have blonde hair. Number two reason, I didn't have a dog named Dollar. But the third reason was I was far from rich. I came from a very, very poor background. And I got to tell you, I learned to achieve and have what I've got. So I'm here to tell you right now and up front that the psychology of rich is really, truly a way and a means for you to shift your relationship to what it means to be successful. So as much as this might be about money and it might be about stuff and it could even be about luxury, it's really about the conversation you have about yourself. So I'm delighted to have prepared a number of slides. We're going to walk through something that's going to be a very keen insight. One, I promise you've never connected the dots before to. It's a part of my MO. I'm a bit of a contrarian. If everyone's saying go left, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go right. And if everyone's split on the decision of going right or going left, we're going to go over or under. But I'm a contrarian. I like to take the road less traveled. You all get me? Just give me a thumbs up. Fantastic. So welcome to the Psychology of Rich. This is being recorded for those who can't meet the time due to time zones, time changes, and things that are in front of them because they've got family, friends, dogs and cats, lovers, and other strangers at their table. So I'm grateful that you're here live. To get to the point, let me start with this. Oftentimes, people will always ask me before I get into the real meat of the lecture tonight, and if you're writing down notes, and particularly, by the way, particularly if you're a coach, an advisor, if you're a professional, if you sell, or if you market, or if you're in the business and or compensated by a function of networking with more people, who here agrees that might describe some of you? Just show of hands. Fantastic. So that's most of you. Living and leading is also a byproduct of selling and marketing. Guess who? You. So when it comes to rich, just to make sure we're on the same page, what's up, Aaron Dunn? I love your acronyms, brother. Keep them going. I love following you. I love what you're up to. Keep it going, man. Keep it cranking. Is rich. So start right there. My definition of rich is a function that leads to the way in which you live and lead in your own life. And the way in which you know you're living it by design and not by default, and here it comes, is your causing and you're creating whatever comes next. And doing so, so that you get to play life like a sport. I would write that down. So this is where some of my banners and some of my battle cries, the sport of rich. And some people say, well, has that got something to do with your performance psychology? Maybe. Does that have something to do with the fact that you've worked with uh, NBA teams and F1 drivers and legendary sports figures? Perhaps. But what I've come to realize after all the years of my existence and being so blessed to learn along the way is life's really a game and it's meant to be played. Depending on where you focus, whether it's relationship or business, entrepreneurship, or for today, 
all things financial, to play a sport of rich means to play so you know you can win. But you can equally lose. So there's something at stake. By the way, a real quick bonus question. What would be at stake? Ends with the, starts with an L, ends with a knife. Hold on, let's see who's got it. Who's, let's see who's got it. Oh, look at Marlene. She was quick with the fingers. Life. With Phil Mills quickly right behind her. Life. Life's but a game. So what the idea in life is to get richer in the things you need so to grow and experience being in it with power, with grace, and with ease. So to me, it's about fuel. Being richer means having a full tank. A full tank of what? A full tank of the financial resources. What are financial resources? We can talk about diamonds, rubies, golds, and nuggets, but you can't pay bills with that stuff and you can't readily exchange them very well. So you want to talk about the three distinctions that I say make up your financial life. The first is money, and that's the tangibility. That's what we call currency. And yes, they can come in coins and yes, they can come in dollar bills. But currency can also be lines of credit, your credit cards, the dollars it takes to get where you're going. Money. The second is wealth. And wealth is stuff. Nice house, good car, many ling things, many things that are bling. But just because you have a lot of money and just because you have a lot of wealth doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a lot of worth. And worth is defined as the value you give to and get from life. And I've learned in my ripe age that the older we get, the less money and wealth matters. The older we get, the less money and wealth matters. I remember when I was in my 20s, all I wanted to be is rich. Lots of money, right? Have all the nice stuff. And then just when I got lots of money, I needed to have lots of wealth. Drive a nice car, be in a bigger home, have nice things. But at some particular point, we start to shift our relationship with what it means to view and value the things that are most important to us. You all track this so far? And it might just be because of life. It may have been of your upbringing, your relationship to God or a superior being, but something shifted in you where you said, it's not all about the money and it's not all about the wealth. It's about worth. And worth functionally is where you have more time, more choice, and the freedom to choose. That's the ultimate worth. Doing as you want, as you want, whenever you want to. What's up, Jay? Good to see you. Good to see you, Mila. Milagro Sanchez in the house. Good to see you. New York representing. Miss you, darling. So with all that being said, the idea then is to live life powerfully with power, grace, and ease. You want to grow richer by having more. More what? More money, more wealth, more worth. And that, what I'd say, functions as the things that matter most to you, no matter what. Do you all get that? So that's the framework. That's what I would call the keystone, the opening thesis, the framework for why this conversation really matters. So for all of the people that are here and curious and wondering what does the psychology of rich means, you need to know that rich is a way of life and a way to lead. Two is growing richer, is richer with fuel. What's fuel? The things that are financial in your life. More money, more wealth, more worth. And they move depending on your stage and depending on your state, depending on your stage in life and depending on your state in life. So the name of the game is to play it like one so that you can have more of the things that you need so you can do a thing in your life without compromise. So far, so good? Great. Now, where's this psychology? Well, here's what I want to say. Let's get to a deck. I prepared a couple of slides to make sure that those who are tracking at home we have a lot of coaches in the house right now. And if you are one, by the way, go into the chat room and just share us your name. If you're a coach, an advisor, a consultant, someone who's coaching people in life, in leadership, in sales, I know we've got some 10Xers in the house. I know we've got a number of Maxwell folk in the house. I know we've got investors in the house. Just get yourself acquainted in there. Just introduce yourself in the chat room. Who are you by means of how do you function in the world? How do you identify in the world? I want to take a look. All right, let's take a look. Oh, by the way, my team just said that we're also live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So what's up, everybody? I know threads are a coming, so I know we'll be there too. So it's a real great thing. A big shout out to the entire team, Annalisa, Andreas, Ken, well done. But I do want to say I love the fact that we first and foremost have in the house 
a rich advisor uh, and also a GC licensee. Marlene's in the house. Great to see Uncaging Your Roar with Jay Dehan. Chris Dennis, of course, a great coach and accomplished student. Uh, I see Gobi. What's up, man? That dude's a legend. I know you're a content creator and you're also a magic maker. It's great to see Maureen, a solar consultant. Aaron, of course, is a heroic performance coach. Uh, Vienna is an entrepreneur, a musician, but also an incredible musical theater, non-for-profit type of gal. Jennifer's in the house. She's a uh, financial advisor, mother, and coach. I bet you the toughest job is being that mom. It's great to see you, Don Smith. Uh, it's great to see Rose with investment strategies. It's great to see Danielle with stress coaching. It's great to have Nicholas Simon, uh, who's a serial entrepreneur. And I'm going to take that to mean not serial like the thing you eat, but the thing you do and love doing so much of it. And the list goes on. Take a look at the in the in the chat room and take a look at who's in here. Let's get started. I want to dive deep into some content because I know for those folks who are at home and wondering what are we covering, I want to make sure you all get this. Uh, in case you don't know on the screen, it should be elevate your life. Marlene, you're the first below me. Do you see that? Just thumbs up. Fantastic. Thanks, Ken. Keep your eye on the prize, man. Get your family where you got to go. Need not look at the phone. You're uh, you're already clear on my content. So tonight. The psychology of rich is really about running a session whereby we talk about what is psychology as it relates to growing rich. Well, psychology first and foremost must be defined in order for it to be the context. Yeah. So psychology by definition is in fact the study of the soul. When you look at the study of the soul, this could be a very powerful statement, but it also is a very dark and haunting perspective. It derives from the ancient Greek seek meaning breath, spirit, or soul, and logos translated as the study of. So in ancient Greek, therefore, psychology really was the study of the soul. So whenever I talk about psychology, it's not meant to be a neuroscientific or it's meant to speak over you. I really do agree with the first allocation of definition. This is the study of your soul, the thing that makes you tick, the breath, the spirit, the soul of who you are. So when we look deeper at the psychology term, even as a phrase and a framework, in the contemporary context, psychology is defined as the scientific study of the mental processes and behavior of humans and other animals. And I'm not calling anyone here in particular the other animals. You know I'm talking about, you can. But what I do know is psychology also refers to the application of such knowledge to various spheres of human activity, including uh, of individuals' daily lives and the treatment of mental illness. This is where we know psychology to be really like, a, like an application of sorts, where people go and fix stuff. That's where in that field, a professional practitioner or even a researcher is often called a psychologist. And psychologists are classified as social or behavioral scientists, meaning that they're really interested in behavior of organisms, both in isolation or amongst groups. So when you look back at the history of psychology, because it's important to understand, it really was a scholarly study of the mind and behavior that dates back to those ancient Greeks. So psychology now borders on various other fields. And it's so important to understand this before I get to the rich part, the money, wealth, and worth part. Why? Because psychology neighbors its cousins such as physiology, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, sociology, anthropology, and yes, even philosophy. I, by the way, I would even go so far as to call phenomenology into play, like the study of existentialism like the, the ontology of who we are, but that's getting a little bit deep and I know it's late at night, so I don't want to go there. So we know that psychology was a branch of philosophy until about 1879 when psychology developed as an independent scientific discipline in Germany. Yes, in Germany. They did many other things like inventing the Porsche and the BMW, the Mercedes Benz and psychology. And psychology, and I would write this down, especially if you're a coach, as a self-conscious field of experimental study. And it began back in 1879. Now, why is all this important? Because I know a lot of people who follow me and a lot of people who subscribe to our stuff are coaches, mentors, trainers, consultants, teachers, yes? So you've got to know that a big part, whenever you break something apart, whether whatever you want to help people unlearn and relearn something, you've got to get to the origin of where you wish to access it. So for me, it's understanding psychology because that's our entry point. Now, why that's important, if you're making notes, and I would write this down, that which you see in bold, is if you understand and respect the place of psychology, 
you'll then understand it drives behavior. It drives what? Out loud so I can hear you all? Behavior. That's right, Phil. I saw that. You know, wake up the kids. You see, that's important to know because behavior by definition really is the way in which one acts or conducts oneself, especially towards others. So when we look at behaviors, they're the actions or reactions of a human or animal in response to external or internal stimuli. Now, if you're a real advanced student here and you want to really develop some professional prowess inside the space of coaching people, I want you to write down that catch of phraseology, external and internal stimuli. You'll thank me later. I'll say it one more time. Behavior is the actions or reactions of a human in response to external and internal stimuli. That is starting to put a highlight in what's about to come next, but I don't want to digress. Now, you see, friends, behavior can be overt. Behavior that is open and observable, for example, like a frown or being covert, like, you know, being able to have these behaviors, they're all what we call micro gestures. And in those micro gestures, they're not just the way your face looks. You can also be found in your voice, the way in which you articulate, the way you project or the way you use your hands to bring something out of a thought or concept and communicate. Y'all get that? That behavior piece is big. Why? Because it is the interface between you and mankind. Your behavior is the interface between you and mankind. Behavior that is not directly observable, but may be inferred from overt behavior could be the increase of your heartbeat, the increase of your breath, perhaps the shallowness of your breath or the sweatiness of your palms. These are other extensions of your behaviors. And I'm not going to point out who here has sweaty palms, like, you know, perhaps Latisa or Don or Phil, you know, maybe Marlene on a, on a, on salsa night, but I digress. Psychologists are interested in behavior, both covert and overt. So it's important to understand this all important because what we know, and I want you to write this down, is driving these behaviors is chemistry. Oh, ha, 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 ha. Here we go. Buckle up because we're about to dive deep. We now know that rich is a function of playing the sport called rich. We know that playing a sport called rich is all about growing richer in the things that matter. And we know the things that matter is being financially fueled with more money, more wealth, and more worth. And depending on your stage and defined by your state, you will get more of the stuff you need to do what you want, when you want to, because choice, freedom, and the power to choose is the ultimate worth. So what about that chemistry? Well, the chemistry is important because the reality here is what we know is that there's a thing called, and here it comes, behavioral driven chemistry. What we know about this is chemistry really by definition is the branch of science that deals with the identification of the substances of which matter is composed. But when you go deeper than what it really is, it's the investigation of their properties and the ways in which they interact, combine and change. Ever notice that you feel good after certain meals, but you don't feel good after others? The idea is that when chemistry occurs, what you have is you create what we call new substances. I like the book of I Ching's quote when it comes to understanding chemistry, that when two foreign substances come together, and if there's a reaction, both are forever transformed. It's kind of the same. So when we look at the psychology of rich and chemistry, being a part of the function to the psychology piece, chemistry is the complex emotional or psychological interaction between two people. If you're making notes, I would write that down. That's according to the Oxford Dictionary. Chemistry is the complex, very intricate, complicated, emotional or psychological interaction between two people. Just a pause for a moment, because there's a lot of people here who are coaches, advisors, speakers, and trainers. You've got to know that when you navigate people, taking them from point A to point B, what you're really navigating to is the complex landscape between you and your coachee, your client, your customer, the person you are being paid to transform. And that landscape is both emotional and psychological, and it's shaped by the interactions that you have. You all track that? So bear that in mind when you're coaching and training and inspiring people. Now, why does this matter? Because chemistry, friends, drives the psychology of money. And here we begin. Let me just pause for a second. 
for those who don't know, I mean, I didn't come from the Lucky Sperm Club, and I certainly didn't go to like some really important Golden Gate College. I mean, I just grew up a pretty average kid with a military type dad and a government working mom. They broke up when I was young and there began the challenge. But my point is this, is that I had no real leg up in making more money than anybody else. I just so happened to have fallen into the financial services business by accident, not by design. I watched a movie. It was called Wall Street. I thought Gordon Gecko was someone good. I thought greed was the current mood of the day. And I went to go find myself a job in the stock brokerage business. I got a job as a cold call cowboy making 300 cold calls a day full time. That was my job. Wearing a tie I stole from my father that I never unknotted because I didn't know how to tie one in a suit that barely fit me. But I knew I wanted to be there because that was what I felt compelled to do. What drew me to that world, I had no clue what a lot of money looked like. Y'all remember when you were dirt broke? You didn't know what rich looked like. Y'all get what I'm saying? You didn't know what rich looked like. I mean, today, thanks to social media, we know what rich can look like. I mean, I don't know about you, but Michael Rubin didn't invite me to the white party in uh, the Hamptons this weekend. I know what Jay-Z and Beyonce are kicking up. I know that Grant Cardone has a lot of things that fly in the air, like private jets and amazing helicopters. I know what rich looks like. But when I was getting started, I had no idea what rich meant. So what I was drawn to, by way of telling you the story, it wasn't the what people had. And it wasn't even the stuff they possessed. It was the feeling I got. And that gives us an insight to what drives the underbelly and the undercurrent to what I've come to call the psychology of rich. Chemistry drives the psychology of money. It drives the way we interact with it. It drives the way in which we set goals and aspirations, and it drives the way in which we collaborate, plan, prepare, and partner with people. It's not the professional we seek. It's not their skills they've got. It's not even the expertise they possess. It's the chemistry. It's the chemistry of how you are drawn wishing to emulate that which you don't have. We're drawn. Let me dig deeper. You see, chemistry is an interesting one. What is going on in the mind gives rise to what's going on in your life. And I do mean financially because this is a financial conversation. So whatever's going on up here gives rise to what's going to go on out there. If out up here is unsettled, it will transmute in the world. Y'all get that? And a very unforgiving part of your world is money because money doesn't lie. Relationships lie. Your husband lies. Your wife will lie. Your lover will lie. Your dogs can lie. Your kids can lie. Your employer can lie. Everyone can pretend that whatever you've got going up over here is okay by them. The only place that your mind can't fool are results. Results in their totality, the only place that you can't lie about is what do you make? What do you generate? What do you have? What do you save? What are you worth? You all get that? And that's not a judgmental thing to say. I'm just saying I can, I can hide from everything. I can pull my waistband up and give myself a real great lean feeling, but I know I'm overweight. I, I can even, in fact, weigh myself at the end of a day just because I know I'll be lightest at that point. I can tell myself a number of stories, but there's some unreal advantages of knowing that there's an unavoidable truth about just where money lands for me. So what you've got to know is you've got to understand your chemistry, because once you understand your chemistry, you will understand your life financially. Understand your chemistry, you will understand your life financially. So what do I mean by this? Well, let me introduce you to your richer chemistry. Yes, I've called it the richer chemistry. You can call it any chemistry you want. It's your chemistry. And just because I called it richer doesn't mean it's mine. This is not Richard Dolan chemistry. This is your chemistry. Yeah. Richer chemistry means, well, what? It's the opposite to poor chemistry. <laughs> you don't want poor chemistry. This is not the this is not the master class on mediocrity. This this is not how to rule average. This, this is about growing richer in the things that you want, not poor in the things that you've always wanted. The richer chemistry is comprised of four typical chemicals: dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphin. Now, I'll get into those in a minute, but let me explain why their place is important. And I say it early so that you can get acquainted with these terms. And a lot of people here likely know what 
dopamine means, yeah? They know what dopamine means. They know what it means or serotonin or oxytocin or endorphins. But here's the reality. What we know about this chemistry is that when your brain releases one of these chemicals, you automatically feel better. We know this for a fact. Researchers have known this for years. And it'd be nice if they all surged and were sustained at peak levels all the time, but they just don't work that way. That's not how your inner chemistry works. Each of these happy chemicals has a special job to do. And once that job is done, they turn off. So the question becomes, how do you keep them on? Or how do you then replace the ones that aren't serving you with one that's richer for you? And that's why we're always looking for ways to turn on our rich chemicals, yeah? We always want to make sure that we're turning them on. And we already know how to do that. Turn on some music, go for a walk, get grounded outside, or get to our social media. But when it comes to your richer chemistry, here's what you've got to know. What you've got to know is that when we find something that works, we repeat it. And so when you know that the brain then builds what we've come to call the rich chemical habit, that's right, the rich chemical habit. You repeat what you feel great by. And you rarely will repeat that which makes you feel poor. So when this happens, what you need to know is that many of these happy, feel good, feel lit up habits have negative side effects. Unhappiness results. Your brain may react by trying harder to trigger these happy chemicals in the same old ways. But I want you to write this note down. Just because you were able to trigger a rich chemistry within you the first time successfully doesn't mean it could be triggered the same way. Ever notice that you've spent more time on social media today, more today than ever before? Ever notice that it's harder today to look for a really great show on Netflix, for example, than ever before? And some of you might argue, well, there's fewer shows and there's more people to follow. That's not true. What some of our researchers would suggest, especially our behavioral finance experts, is that the ways in which you've tapped into your richer chemistry, your feel-good chemistry, has been weaning. So you spend more time doing the very same thing you used to that made you feel great in the moment, and now it takes hours to get the same feeling. Y'all tracking this? Now, we're going to tie this together so why this matters with our world of money. See, when your brain may react by trying harder thing, harder to trigger happy chemicals, feel good chemicals in the same old ways, a poor loop begins. And I would write that down. What's a poor loop? Well, the poor loop is, in fact, something you need to break. And this is largely why many people get stuck. And I want you to remember this because this is going to be the second most powerful thing I'm going to say. They get stuck earning the same amount of money they have for the past one, two, five years. They typically will drive the same car for exactly the same amount of time, if not longer, and they get stuck what they would call a financial rut. They're stuck and by hitting what they've come to call the proverbial glass ceiling, the law of limitations. Y'all tracking this? Give me a thumbs up. When in fact, what I'm willing to assert is this. It's not the phenomenon of money, wealth, or worth that you seek. It's the breaking of a poor loop that's not serving you. In other words, as a lot of people who have been saying, it's all in your mind. My good friend, Tony Robbins would say that. It's all in your mind. He's right. But to get more specific, it's all about that poor loop. We've got to get you out of that poor loop by getting you into one of those four chemical chasing pathways. What do I mean? You see, we each struggle to manage a brain that seeks happy chemicals in the way it learns from the past experience. That's where we call hardwiring. Everyone just say hardwiring. Hardwiring. These are neural pathways that are basically shortcuts. And the stronger those neural pathways become, the more memorable they become. Remember, your brain is wired to short wire. It needs faster tracks. That's why we're creatures of habit. You likely brush your teeth the same way you did a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. You likely comb your hair the exact same way you have for years. Don't believe me? Just ask uh, Ken. Ask how he prepares his day. All kidding aside, and for those who are visually challenged, uh, Ken has no hair. I mean, no hair. But he shines that head very delicately. Uh, what we know is the good news about this breaking of the poor loop is that you can escape the loop. You can build a new rich habit in exchange for an old one. And you can do it in 30 days. 
Now, before we go deeper in what that, that means, 30 days, I, I got to say something. Some people would suggest that to build a new habit takes you 66 days. My friend Robin Sharma writes about that in the 5 a.m. club. Some scientists have said 45 days. Some people will say 30. But I'm even willing to say it takes you one day to build a habit. It could take you one day. Want to prove it? Imagine this. Go turn on your oven to about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah? Then stick your hand in it when it's at the peak level of heatness, when it's hotness. Yeah? Stick it in there and burn your hand. Now, hold on. I'll give you some time to go and just start the oven. Now, once you burn yourself, let me ask you the question. How long will it take for you to form a healthier habit with that oven when it's on full blast? Not long at all. You all get that? In other words, I believe that according to behavioral scientists, they wanted to create enough room for people to adopt and adapt the abandonment of an old habit or the abandonment of old thinking to make the transition more bearable. Because it's easier for us to have a slow departure than an immediate one. You all get that? Now, the bad news about doing it this way is that first and foremost, it's going to be hard. All of us operate with poor loops. They get themselves into a bit of a loop and all of a sudden you find yourself in a bit of a rut, a performance rut, or a complaint, what we call a racket. Also, it won't feel good for 30 days. As long as you're trying to shift from one old way of thinking to a new one, it's going to feel foreign for you. And it may even feel like your survival is threatened. Why? Because most behaviors that are hardwired by the brain is an extension of its survival mechanism. The minute you do something that's a departure from predictable, your brain will say we're threatened. Our existence is under threat. And it will retreat. It will force you to retreat. Your little brain will say to you, uh, this is very risky, Marlene. What do you think you're doing here? Uh, Leticia, then stop thinking so big. Motivation's overrated. And you start to recoil back to a former self. So what we know when breaking this poor loop is that you've got to really consider why is it important to break it? You all get that? Why is it important to break it? Well, breaking the poor loop. It's easier when you know how your brain works. So when you look at this, this particular presentation tonight is all about giving you three really cool brain savvy tips to build new richer habits with fewer negative side effects. And what's really cool about tonight is that when this presentation is over, you're going to choose one tonight, right now. And whether you're watching the recording or you're watching this in the morning, you're going to take one old poor habit that you'd like to replace and put a new one in its place. And you're going to want to plan in detail how you will activate that new behavior for the next 30 days. And as you rewire your behavior, you rewire the brain itself. And I would write that down, especially if you're coaches. I'll say that one more time. When you select a new behavior and you commit to it for the next 30 days, your brain is rewiring itself, resetting new neural pathways with the path that you've chosen with this new habit you're adopting. That's the part that I would say is important for 30 days. The 30 days part isn't to change your behavior. It's to change your brain's wiring. This is where neuroplasticity comes into play. This is where people are saying you can actually rebuild, retrain, relearn in the brain you've got because the brain is quite, well, vibrant that way. So when we look at breaking this poor loop, what you want to know is that there's three tips for doing it fast. One is that you want to know that over the next 30 days, release yourself from judgment. Tonight, as I explained to you what those four chemicals are, as we focus on which one of those four serves you best, you want to make sure that as you're looking at new habits, especially when it comes to pursuing more in your life, you've got to do so inside of a frame time frame of time that does not have you judging yourself, not assessing, not concluding, not evaluating, zero judgment. Y'all got that? That's number one. Number two is you got to make peace with your poor chemicals. It's not about just accepting. It's a function of atoning. And atonement is to really be complete and whole and at peace with the very poor attitude, thought pattern, or mentality that you once had. 
And then you got to choose your new, what I'd say, a richer habit wisely. And that one's got to serve you. By the way, how do you know that a new habit or way of thinking serves you? You ready for it? You ready for the answer? It moves you. If it doesn't move you, it doesn't serve you. I would write that down. If it doesn't move you, it doesn't serve you. I would even go so far as to say, and it can slowly kill you. Now, you got to remember, as we dig deep in here tonight, is that what we've got is your brain equates old learning with survival. So even when you learn something uh, unhealthy, let's say, there's no delete button in your brain. <laughs> but you have the power to build a new circuit by putting your focus elsewhere. That's the idea. It's not about saying that we got to delete this focus. It's about finding a new focus, something new to focus your energies, your bandwidth, your resources, your entire being elsewhere. And that new circuit must now grow big and strong because the old circuit will always be there. So I'll say that one more time. You'll never, ever totally get rid of old habits, old ways of viewing money, old ways of going about attracting wealth, old ways of approaching getting more. You'll never, ever get rid of it, but you can weaken its grip on you. Because when in doubt, we default. I would write that down. When in doubt, we default. So by electing something new, this is why I love people becoming new real estate investors, right? Because it's something brand new. And they immediately go into a whole new way of attracting money and creating money. And it's short-lived. Why? Because it didn't fortify the neural pathways to keep making investing in something they didn't know a regular phenomenon. So in the world of money, if you want to make more, if you want to get wealthier, if you want to generate more worth, you've got to form the new pathways in your brains fortified by chemistry that you will continue to attract. Making sense? All right. Now, by breaking this poor loop, by the way, you're not judging yourself for 30 days. Remember, and your brain needs about 45 days of repetition for a new habit to start feeling normal. So in 30 days, you'll start noticing a shift, but in 45 days, it'll be pretty darn good. But you're going to have to know something. You got to accept all those bad days. You don't want to expand the bad feelings by judging yourself. Your brain is a pretty complex contraption. Number two is what you got to know is that you got to make peace with those poor chemicals. So what that means is unhappy chemicals are really a part of your brain's normal operating system. So all the bad feelings and emotions, thoughts and or thought patterns, however it makes you feel when you think about generating more money, more wealth, more worth for yourself, you got to know that that's all a part of your survival mechanism. The only reason why you're stuck in a poor loop is only because it keeps your survival mechanism intact. It doesn't want you getting up early. It doesn't want you getting out there and taking risks. It doesn't want you going out there and making calculations on a great best chances efforts basis. It just wants you to stay still to survive. It's the one function our brains have perfected over 3 million years. Survive. Let's survive to the end. So unhappy chemicals are not a bad thing. They just don't serve us thing. Next, you got to know is they alert you to survival threats the way happy chemicals alert you to survival as well. So you've got to know that if you run from them, you'll always be running. You can learn to live with them. And I want you to write that down. This is not about running away from them. It's about living with them. But I'm not happy anytime soon. And I've been very miserable for a long time. Got it. Accept it. Move on. And not move on as in fire them or fire yourself or divorce or leave or quit or go. It's accept it. Atone with it. If you're running, you're ruining. But if you are forming, you are now firing. And forming anew is about just choosing a new focus for yourself. Now, why do poor chemicals seem to surge when you do things that are good for yourself? Well, a couple of things you should know. They were there all along, but you were likely masking them with a happy habit. You know what I'm talking about. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll go out, I'll buy something I really want, but about maybe a day or two later, I'm like, gosh, I should really take that back because I don't think I need that, right? Or, or you know, poor chemicals surge 
when you do things that are good for yourself. And all of a sudden what ends up happening is that these unhappy chemicals are always now trying to protect you by finding some potential harm. You know what? It, they did say interest rates were going to go up and the market really hasn't flattened out yet. So, you know, maybe that's a good warning. That's a good signal. That, that, that might be something worth me looking at. We find reasons, excuses, and justifications to undo the very things that make us happiest. And they feel bad because that's what works. Your brain knows how to get your attention. I'm going to say it one more time in a very profound way. You are perpetually screwed because every time you're happy, it's a threat to your survival mechanism. So the minute you're happy, you're going to get a surge of poor chemicals to depress what it is that you feel so damn good about. Why? It gets your attention. It gets your attention so that you get to get whacked out of a state of euphoria, not feel lit up, not living your calling, not motivated, not inspired, but back to normal, back to surviving small and insignificant. And that's where we get frustrated. Y'all get this? All right. So instead of perceiving unhappy chemicals as urgent disasters, you can accept them as natural blips in the awareness of you being a mortal being. In other words, everything is fine. You are perfect the way you are, and you are perfect the way you are not. It's okay. You all get that? It's all just a matter of it being a sport. We got to learn to play this game a little bit different. So in breaking this poor loop, in making peace with your poor chemicals, uh, which I think I just said, because I think that's just repeating my slide. Oh, there's something fancy. So in breaking that loop, what we want to do is you then want to choose your new, richer habit wisely. This is what's really key and important. What we know about this is that you have four happy chemicals to choose from, four of them. Now, I want you to write these down right now because I'm going to explain what they are. Dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. So these are the four. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come out of this presentation right now, and I'm going to share with you what these are and what that means for all of us. You all ready for this? So let me pause for a second. Is that Bethany in the house? What's up, girl? How you been? I don't know who's in here now because I've been in the presentation mode. Bobby Grassi in the house? What's up, stud? It's good to see Doc in the house. Oh, so great to see all of you guys. It feels like it's a reunion. That's what it feels like. I'm blessed. Let's see here. Emma's in the house and Elza. What's up, Ileana? It's great to see you, Ian and Karthik. It's great to have a lot of you guys here. All right, let's get back to work. Uh, is this tracking okay? We good? All right. So here's where we started. If we're playing a sport called rich because life is a game and it's meant to be played and we can really win and really lose, we got it. Now, if we're playing, then what's the sport all about? What does a win look like? It's more. More what? More money, more wealth, more worth. And depending on your stage, and depending on your state, you'll want different things at different times. Now, doesn't matter what more looks like, but more means more of what matters most to you no matter what. It's life on your terms, by design, not by default. The psychology of rich would assert that in the behavioral finance world, that when we pursue more, we are not looking for more money, more wealth, more worth. A function of getting to those things is chemistry. So the big breakthrough, number one of three, and I'm going to give you a summary in one statement, is the psychology of rich is a function. If you're writing this down, the psychology of rich is a function of chemistry, not cash. You feel poor, shift your mind. You've gone broke, you've gone broke in your mind. You feel like you're not attracting more money, more opportunity, more networking, more people. You don't have a greater, stronger bandwidth opportunity set or linguistic set to go and get you what you want. You've got to shift the chemistry in your mind. It's about how you feel. It's not about what you seek as fuel. It's all in here. That's breakthrough number one. Now, let's get to those chemistries, yeah? Let me look and see where I put my stuff. Oh, here it is. So what we've got here is your brain, by the way. I want you to write this down. Your brain wants them all. I, I, I see the look on, who am I looking here? Milagro, she, I, I see Marlene, uh, Vincent for sure. You know, I mean, don't be fooled by uh, Keith's good looks and Phil's little smile there. Our brains want it all. You want all of it. You want the dopamine, the serotonin, the oxytocin, the endorphins. But what you've got to do is you've got to approach your chemistry like a well-balanced diet, a well-balanced happiness diet. You don't stick to one you're already good at. You want to have a balance across them all. 
Now, what does that mean? Well, if something feels good, it promotes survival for your primitive ancestors. But these rich chemicals, these make you happy lit up chemicals, connect the neurons and the brain then learns to get more of those feeling good. But as I've said, too much of a good thing is often bad. So good and bad feelings flow at once. I want to say that one more time. Good and bad feelings flow at once. And your brain decides which choice promotes your well-being. So this is a huge breakthrough. Hold on, Rich. What you're saying to me is that if, 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 if I'm feeling great and then I equally feel bad, ultimately what's deciding how I ultimately feel given these two experiences chemically are flowing through my brain at the exact same time, my brain decides how I feel? That's right. Because wherever you're focused on, your chemistry will flow and your brain will follow. So this is why one of the things I love about what Grant Cardone says a lot about what Tony has always been saying for the 17 years I've been associated with him is you've got to write down those goals, not as a thing to do, but the way your brain can be. It's not just an ontological shift. It's not just a matter of phenomenology. It's a matter of your existentialism. It's a matter of saying, my goals shape how my brain decides whatever's firing through my chemistry. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Most days I don't feel so great. Not like sick, not unwell, but I got lots of things going on. Most times I want to just put 10 into a headlock. And I know that's an impossible task. But my point is, is that we all have moments of frustration, true? Overwhelm, right? Or maybe even underwhelm. But my brain is always choosing the one that's aligned. Here it comes, guys, with my life's intention. <laughs> my life's intention. And as long as my life's intention, which is my calling, could be your purpose, could be your uh, life's mission, your quest, or the thing that really is what you'd call a life statement. But my calling is that all people are lit. And a great demonstration of that calling is who's always lit. <laughs> I'm always lit. So I put myself on notice. I'm my biggest paying client. I'm my only coachee that matters. Every day I coach myself at the crack of dawn. I'm the first person. Why? Because my brain is trained right from the get-go. It doesn't matter what's going on or how bad it gets. This is where we're going. What matters is forward and up, not backwards and down. Does that communicate? Give me an okay. So how can I stimulate these richer chemicals, Rich? How do I, how do I get this happy, lit up, feeling without bad consequences? Well, it's never going to be easy. I mean, again, they, 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 these chemicals weren't meant to surge all the time. They do turn off when the job is done. So dopamine, if you're writing this down, by definition, is the great feeling that you will succeed at meeting your needs. Dopamine. A great time to achieve a great dose of dopamine is when? First thing in the morning. This is where a lot of great books and a wonderful amount of work done by Jim Quick and my other friends all say the same thing, is you want to do something great for yourself so that you do something within the first hour of your awakening that's your victory hour, something for you. You know what this sounds like. A lot of you already practice it, right? Reading for a bit, working out, meditating, grounding yourself talking to God, whatever it does to let you own your day. And I say this to my students at Rich U, because we get together every Monday so that we can create and cause a week worth wanting, is I say that if you own Monday, you'll own every day. And it really starts Monday mornings. You see, your ancestors felt the joy of dopamine when they found a new berry patch or, or, or fishing pole after, after hungry wandering days. Dopamine connects the neurons so your brain turns on the dopamine the next time you see signs of a berry patch or fishing hole. So what you want to do is do something, here it comes, is you want to do something every morning that the minute your eyes see it, it triggers dopamine because what it's going to get is the great feeling that you will succeed at meeting your needs. Now, dopamine turns on often when an alcoholic sees a bar or a wandering eye sees a hot prospect like Don or a video game player wins points, or a drug user finds a new supply, or a reward falls into your lap. But for good reasons too, when you achieve a long sought out goal, that's good. When you take a step toward a goal, that's good. When you see another move toward your goal, that's good. When your efforts are rewarded, that's good. 
And when you invest effort and expect it to re be rewarded, that's good. But here's the problem I have with all that. You ready for this? It's always out there somewhere and I have no control over it. So I'm the kind of person that would rather take full control over how I experience my own life within my own body. You all get that? So my recommendation as a life coach of the moment is to make sure that you're setting yourself up to get a hit of dopamine first thing in the morning. Yeah. Now, a lot of people that would ask me, well, well, well how do I know uh, that dopamine is uh, the hit? Here it comes. I want you to write this down. It's the I got it feeling. Y'all remember the moment you had an I got it feeling? You know, when you first learned how to ride a bike or you found a parking spot close to the door? I got it, right? Or you're winning a, I don't know, a, a crossword puzzle or, or you, you know, you planned a meal, you found something you were looking for, you, you, you're playing a musical instrument and you bang that note out right. Getting a promotion stimulates dopamine. You can get a promotion every day if you wanted to. But if you only focus on getting promoted or that parking spot or learning how to ride a bike, your only positive expectation will erode because how often will you learn how to ride a bike for the first time? See the point? So the key is you want to diversify your dopamine efforts. It can't be the same every day. So to generate a dopamine hit, you want to be able to look for the I got it feeling every single day, right when you get up. Now, the second one is serotonin. And, and serotonin is an interesting one because serotonin is the chemical that has you flow. It flows when you feel important, when you feel like you belong, when you feel connected, even loved. Now, this brain we've inherited seeks importance because that promotes survival in the state of nature. And sometimes, I do mean sometimes, people make bad choices to get that nice serotonin feeling. And sometimes people give up on that feeling important and because it feels bad too. Now, you can find healthy ways to feel important, but you can't control the world around you and the importance it gives you. But you can train your brain to feel confident in its own importance, regardless of what others do. You can appreciate the importance you have instead of focusing on the importance you don't have. And people will respect you behind your back. Imagine that instead of imagining the worst. So what you're noticing is our brain equates attention with survival because we're born helpless. So we build self-reliance over time, but those early circuits are still there. I want to say this one more time. We build self-reliance over time, and those early circuits are still there. Your survival does not depend on getting attention today. Oh, my God, I walked into the office the other day, and I always say hi and good morning to Jim and Jack and Jill, and they didn't say good morning to me today. Oh, my God, what's up with them? Right? Your survival does not depend on getting that attention, but it feels that way unless you build a new circuit. So the brain keeps seeking importance no matter how much you have because the serotonin feels good. So what's that look like? Look for ways to make a contribution, generate value, and give people a, uh, gee, thank you for that. Hold a door open for a stranger. Buy a coffee for the person behind you at Starbucks. Maybe that's a bad example because they're pretty expensive over there at, uh, you know, I don't know, Tim Hortons. You know what I'm saying. But you're doing something to feel good. This is where what's amazing is networking is amazing. Doing Zoom calls like this is amazing. Acknowledging people is amazing. Even having a buddy system where you check in with someone on a regular basis is amazing. And for those who are rich youth students and have been a part of my mastery programs, you know I'm a big promoter of teaming people up. Just checking in with people to say, hey, I see you, I got you, I appreciate you. Boom, you're good. The third is oxytocin. And this one's tough because it's the feeling of trust. You see, oxytocin gives you a good feeling when you're with someone you trust. Social trust feels good because social alliances promote survival, but misplaced trust does not promote survival. Solid trust bonds take time and effort to build. This is why I love doing these group sessions. This is why I love being of service to you. Now you can stimulate oxytocin by enjoying the trust you have instead on focusing on the trust you don't have. You can build new trust bonds in small steps over time. And time, rather trust, builds each time expectations are met. 
So what I would often do, because I'm really horrible at keeping all my promises, is I'm constantly on the hunt with where I'm out. That's why Annalisa and Ken, who are a part of my inner circle and team, manage me because I'm going nuts trying to track down where I might be out of what we would call integrity because we miss things. So all I'm looking for is if I need to do something, if I'm out of integrity with someone, then I'll immediately acknowledge it. But you can build trust with anyone by making the steps small enough so that you can start to negotiate expectations that both parties can meet and repeat again and again. So here's one little short hack. Whenever you're about to reach out to someone, if you said you would, say to them, hey, it's amazing that you're reaching out to me right now. As promised, here's what I've got for you. Y'all get that? Or as promised, I'm writing today. You can text people and say, hey, I told you I would talk to you on Tuesday or make an effort tomorrow. Here I am. Acknowledge those moments like you've made a commitment. Said a different way is when you want to produce and generate trust, speak in such a way that has you fulfill promises, let's pretend, that you've made. I said I'd come back to you. I promised I would. Here I am as stated. Here I go as committed. You all get that? And when you can't, say so. Last but not least is endorphins. And endorphins are very cool because it's, um, it's a brief euphoria that masks physical pain. Endorphins help your ancestors get help when injured. Real physical distress triggers uh, endorphins. Like, uh, you've ever gone for a run? Any, any runners in the room? You go on that, on that run, you have what's called the runner's high. And it only happens when you exceed your limits, when you push. Creating pain to enjoy the endorphin is a bad survival strategy. But let's create right now a sudden burst of endorphins. Y'all ready? Y'all ready for this? Who wants to play? Just show of hands. Who wants to play? Let's play full out, okay? On a count of three, no matter where you are, no matter where you are, unless you're in a birthing ward and like babies are sleeping, but let's just, on the count of three, laugh out loud. You ready? One, two, three. <laughs> now, laughing and crying stimulate small bursts of endorphin. Your body just now, your skin just tingled and you know what just did, it just reacted to the endorphin that just went up enough for your entire being to notice endorphins flooded your neural pathways. Now, what's really funny is your brain doesn't know what was funny. They didn't know if uh, Kevin Hart walked into your living room half naked or, or Richard Dolan said something funny. It doesn't matter because the brain doesn't know the difference. When you generate laughter, and even when you cry, your brain doesn't know why. So manufacturing the physiology of laughter is an immediate way to strike endorphins. I promise you that before I hit a stage, lead a workshop or a lecture, I will break out in a massive laughter just to cheat my body in generating endorphins enough. Now, varying your exercise routine can also uh, stimulate endorphins without harmful excess. So that's important. You all get that? So you ready for the recital? Endorphins is the brief euphoria that masks physical pain. What you've got is oxytocin, and it's the feeling of trust. Now, serotonin flows when you feel important, and, and dopamine is the great feeling that you will succeed at meeting your needs. Those are the four. Those are what we call the rich chemicals. Now, I'm going to open up to some questions in the closing few minutes that we've got. And we've likely got time for maybe two or three questions as we want to wrap down about 12 to 15 minutes out. Because I appreciate people have got dinner on the stove and maybe meals to get to and family to tend to. So I'm sensitive to that. By the way, are we having a great time here so far? Just thumbs up, yeah? Fantastic. So here's my point. If we know that the first breakthrough that we had was that the psychology of rich is a function of chemistry, not cash. Then the second breakthrough I just gave you is that rich and poor, I would write that down, rich and poor are states and not status. They are states, not status. Now, I've got a third one, a final one. I've got it up my sleeve, but I'm not going to share it yet until I hear Montel Fleming's voice because it's been so long. But let's go up to Vienna first. 
and I want to make sure I see her and hear her question out the shoot. Now I'll get to Naran. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Cool. Thank you so much for letting me ask a question. Um, so I wanted to ask you, in light of your, I guess, your experience with seeing the difference that sharing like your wins and just having like a buddy system um, has like on people and on changing and molding behaviors in a really positive way, um, would you be willing to share your five intentions on our Monday morning calls? Because I really want to hear them. Well, my five, so that's a good question. I mean, first of all, I mean, for everyone that's here, and it's important for you all to hear this, is that Vienna is a student at Rich U, and all of you should be a member at Rich U. And if you can't afford it, let us know, we'll figure it out, but you've got to be a member of Rich U, and here's why. It's a community for people who need to be connected to their greater self. And all we are is a social conversational construct that supports people in the spirit of getting you to more. That's it, nothing more, nothing less. So for me, every week, sharing your intentions should come down to one, two, maybe three things. Intentions are not like goals, objectives, and targets. Those are always moving. But your intention is like what my dad would say. When heading into a state of war, we always operate with a commander's intent. We would love to take down the telecommunications tower, serve the front line, perhaps retreat here when the time is right, and perhaps recoup here. But if all hell breaks loose and there's only one thing we can do, what's the one thing, one thing we need to get done? That's called the commander's intent. So I operate with a little bit of that spirit. I have one intention, that people are lit. Everything else I do follows from that. That's my life's intention. Write that down if it's new for you. For you, that might be your life's mission. So whatever I'm doing and whatever I'm up to is always an extension of that. If money is important to me, I might shift focus. If making a difference is important to me, and a lot of my friends who are here, and I'm glad that you are, you know that during the pandemic, being there for you and being there together was the most important thing to me. That experience of all of us together the way we were, and there's a number of people here who know what I'm talking about. That was something that we'll never forget. Courageous conversations, cocktail Fridays, finding out what Mike Tyson was doing to survive the pandemic, or David Hasselhoff, and the list goes on. It was fun times, wasn't it? But there were strange times. But making an impact then was something that needed to shift. So to you, Vienna, here's my point. Your intention is what your life's worth living for. The outcomes, goals, and objectives shift dependent on what you need and want. Because sometimes you just got to eat. Sometimes the kids need new shoes. Sometimes you got to send someone through school and or pay off a debt that's been haunting you. You'll get that. That's called life. And we all have that at various levels and at various times. But the reality is this. Whatever we focus on, it must move you. Because if it doesn't move you, it's killing you. Yeah? Good question, Vienna. But I got you. We'll do that on Monday. I promise. All right, Naran. Danielle and then Aaron. Keep your eye on the road there, Aaron. Hey, Rich. Hey, everybody. Um, Rich, it's more of an observation. I'd like you to comment on my observation. I've been, I've been, I've hung out with you for a number of years. And if you are not part of Rich, you, are you having trouble hearing me? That's just because I'm old, but I, I can hear you fine. Here, I'll just turn my video off in case my uh, wife is. No, no, you're good, buddy. I want to see your handsome face. Okay. We're good. I want to see right. your handsome face. Um, well, actually, no, it's not as handsome as I remember. Turn off the video. No, I'm kidding. Joking. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> See, now we got endorf endorphins growing. That's right. So here's what I noticed, what I've observed about you, that whenever you're presenting, when I hear you do a killer speech, you cause those four things, whether it's dopamine, serotonin, oxygen, and, and uh, endorphin. I'm, yeah, endorphins. Endorphins. endorphins yes you cause those four things to happen in a good speech and in a good and so the the comment or the the highlight that i'm making to myself in my mind is whenever i'm having a conversation what would it feel like is if i was intentional about creating these four things to happen in every interaction i had how would that shift things for people mm. 
See, man, I can always count on you for a real good question. That was a good insight. And by the way, he asked me a good question, by, and he asked me a question in a good way, which was he gave me the compliment, but now came the inquiry. So that's well done. And for those who don't know Naran, he's an accomplished uh, life coach, uh, rich advisor, uh, and also a financial life professional that uh, I'm delighted to call a friend and a, I'm a huge fan of his. So let me let me get straight to it, okay, Naran? F first of all, anything we do, this is just my own personal opinion, okay? This is my personal opinion. Anything you put on, anything you put on to get something from someone is a move. And to me, a move is a maneuver and a maneuver generates inauthenticity. So I don't craft my talks in such a way that says, okay, I got the endorphins handled, I got oxytocin handled. I don't, I don't go down our checklist. What I am though, because of my life's intention, which is that all people are lit, in order for me to be lit, I need those four. Because you want to hear the truth, folks? You want to hear the truth? Those four gets you more. <laughs> those four gets you more. I mean, you can talk about stocks, bonds, mutual funds, put calls and warrants in real estate, but none of it, and I mean, none of it will make you happier, more fulfilled, and God bless than having those four that gets you more. Being happy in your own skin, having a sense of value in view, and knowing that you're worth whatever you say you're worth, no matter what you're worth in numbers. You all get that? So to me, I feel for you is to get connected to how you need to feel in conversations with people. And so long as you're achieving that, you'll attract it. I mean, that's why a lot of people here who are great advisors, coaches, and even consultants, like I know Milagros is like this. Um, I know Marlene is like this. Montel is like this. Keith, you're definitely like this. Man, Aaron's like this. Phil's like this. Um, I don't know you enough yet, Danielle, professionally, but I know I can count on you like this. They're embodying the very thing they want people to have more of. True, everybody, those I just cited the names of, you're already, and I want you to write this down, you're already the living demonstration of what you want for people. That's why they're coming to you. It's really rare you're going to attract people that says, hey, you look like a stud. So am I. It ain't going to happen. Trust me, people say, man, I like how you jive. I love how you speak, Aaron. Those acronyms rock me. Vienna, I love your smile. Montel, you got it figured out with that beautiful family. Naran, how does a brown fellow look so good? I want what you got, right? You get what I'm saying? So when you've got that fired up, when you've got the four, you'll attract more. So don't, if I were to summarize that, Naran, don't get caught up in the performance get caught up in the deliverance. Like, what are you delivering to people that as a result of it leaves you both richer? I know this got a little bit coachy coachy, um, but hey, it's better than hokey pokey. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna go up to Danielle and then Aaron. What's up, Bill? And yes, you do owe me lunch. <laughs> you thought I didn't read that, huh? Come on in, Danielle. Hi. So this is a, I love this because it's just listening for me and it's a great field because when it comes to psychology and the oxytocin, this room is flowing with it, right? So there's a lot of trust, a lot of all four, which is what Naran was saying in this call. And for myself, a habit that I'm going to be working on is when I convey things to other people to do it short and sweet to where it makes more sense to them and it's not all over the place because sometimes I say something like oh so and so's last name is Dolan to strike up a conversation because naturally you're going to start talking yes I am related no I'm not but then that's also a category of mental illness like schizophrenia yeah no I got it I got it. No, and I'm glad to hear your voice. And by the way, I love where you are and I love where you're going. I know your journey and it's come a long way. And I know that you've got uh, a distance ahead, but so do we. We all do. Um, but I want to say this real quick because I think I'm going to I'm going to put my foot in my mouth with Ken. Um, if anyone knows this, especially my New York friends, I have a lab. I have a lab in New York City. It's the place in which I've had a pet project on finding the phenomenon of human existence. Stay with me. Stay with me. I know, Marlene, you're always thinking, you're already thinking. But my point is this. I'm begging Ken to allow me to do a workshop at the by the end of this month in my lab. 
And what I want to help people understand is charisma, which is a cousin of a word I want you to write down, Danielle, curiosity. Charisma and curiosity are cousins, and they are the extension of what I call the power of your presence. So for those of you who know, I love teaching communication skills and how to present one-to-one, one-to-few, one-to-many. And this is not meant to be a pocket pitch because, heck, I'd rather just say, let's all meet in New York and let's run you through my lab because it is a top secret location and you'd be in my lab. It is a phenomenal place. I'm inspired. And there's you'll never have an experience in this room, in this theater, hint, hint, in your entire life. Nothing like it, nothing before it. There's technology there. It's a lab. And there's equipment that does something very powerful. We are going to capture the spirit of your charisma in that room. Like, actually, you're going to be able to see it. And you're going to have a digital proof of it. How cool is that? Do I have your curious? Who here is curious? Give me a little cake. All right, Ken and Lisa, let's make sure we send everyone on this call as a gift to make sure they all know what we're going to do in the lab at, by the end of the month. Because, dude, I want to crank it out by the end of the month. I know Ken. He's giving me that look. Ken's just giving me that look. Uh, for those who are watching, if he hasn't said yet, oh, I got a thumbs up. Okay. I don't know if that was a middle finger or just a thumb, but I'm going to take that as a thumb. All right. Um, now, back to you, Danielle. And, and this is a bit of an extension on Naran. I want you all to write the word down, curiosity. When you're curious with people, genuinely, you trigger two, sometimes three of those four richer chemistries, those richer chemicals. You don't say you got a child? How old? What's their name? What's your relationship like? Or what is it that you do for a living? When did you do that? How long have you been doing this for? Are you happy doing it? Describe to me what it is. When you're genuinely engaged and curious, you activate almost three, sometimes all four of those happy, feel great, lit up chemicals. Just be curious. And you want to know why it's hard to be curious with people? Because most often we're moving so fast, we don't care. I just want to sell you my stuff. I just want to close this deal. I want to upgrade your ticket. But when you slow down, lean in, and learn more from people, that curiosity does catalyze that chemistry. Is that helpful, Danielle? All right. I'm so happy for you. All right. I'm going to Aaron Dunn, and then Milagros Sanchez will have the last word. Come in here, brother. What's up, man? Always good to connect with you. Uh... I mean, masterful, as always. It's just amazing. So, um, By the really way, when you say masterful, Darren, I got to ask, because you're a speaker, a presenter, too, and a coach. What's masterful about what you witnessed tonight? What's your read? Well, I think with what Noran said, like, I would just reiterate what he said. I mean, your presence, your, your enthusiasm, your, um, your articulation of complex ideas and boiling it down into – something that is uh that 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 i can actually take home i mean you you've you've been able to deliver such a like like as a as a poet you know you try to pack in a lot of meaning into a, a few words and you've said a lot of things but the way that you structure your talks um it doesn't matter if it's an hour or 30 minutes you can really take someone from a to Z and have a whole and complete really understanding of something uh, in in such a short amount of time. And it it doesn't matter if you're, if you're here for the full hour or for 10 minutes, Um, I, you, you, you can take so much. So I just want to celebrate that. So two things, brother, first of all, I acknowledge that I take it. I appreciate you. Um, Super grateful for that. Cause coming from you, you uh, have a very qualified view of the world. So that's one, two, here's, here's, I'm going to give you something because I definitely want to talk to you, uh, Mr. Dunn. There's a lot of things I've been watching about what you're doing. So we got to talk. Okay. We got to talk, but I'm going to give you something. Don't forget this. When you're able to unpack for people, the things and at the rate in which I do, which you've witnessed, which you do too, by the way, you realize that you are a teacher and not a preacher. And, And I have a lot of respect for preachers, but preachers are meant to make a point and get it across. But a teacher is meant to say, Hey, I'm going to give it to you. Now you can go do it too. So I want you all, everyone that's here, I know you're all influencers in your various ways and by different means, and you in particular, Aaron. But but when you teach, right? When you teach, that is the ultimate phenomenon of leadership in action. 
And so for me, I'm just wanting to impart knowledge that I don't have. I was lent it. And it's my job to pay it forward. It's not meant for it to be with me. It's meant to be yours and, and Danielle's and, and, and Ken and Jimmy. You all get that. So, so that's important. Aaron, what was the next thing you wanted to say? Because I, I totally took you off track. No, you're good. Um, man, we should talk. I, I would love to talk with you. Um, you know, I, I'm, I haven't been as engaged in your community as I would love to be uh, for ex extenuated circumstances, but um, I would love to chat with you. It would be a, uh, an honor. But uh, I just wanted to uh, pitch and catch with you and uh, give you a power acronym based on what you said, which is ABC, uh, because it's all backed by science, what you're saying. You don't have to cite anything. Your conviction delivers it appropriately. But uh, I think it's uh, James Clear, Atomic Habits, or from uh, Tiny Habits, the book, ABC, anchor, behavior, celebrate, anchor to an existing behavior, whatever that poor thing was, anchor it, anchor, find, identify that poor and anchor it, your new habit to that thing, create that behavior, and then after you do it, immediately celebrate yourself for doing that thing you say that's like me this is the this is the actual version of me the fully alive realized version of me make a celebration out of it do a dance or whatever you got to do abc i love it man i love it keep doing what you're doing uh and keep doing it the way you're doing it because it's authentically uh unequivocally you i appreciate it that's what i'm looking for. that's what i'm working for and uh your influence your fingerprints are on it and I, I think of you uh so often man so really appreciate you hey i think of you too man especially that beard of yours so i appreciate you and uh, keep going keep growing keep growing keep going um god i love that guy great to hear his voice and as i promised milagro sanchez come on in my dear let me unmute you hi hi everyone thank you i'll i'll just follow up on what he said it's been great you share very complex information about the brain and the mind and all these chemicals in a very digestible bite-sized way that we can now go back and kind of start applying right away, which I love because I'm about like, okay, what can I do now? What can I do now in the moment that I have? Then to land to my question is, what if you're on a stage in your life where you're doing all the things, you're, you're in the game, how you say it, you know, you have good days, bad days. I honor all my emotions and all my days. But then you're waking up early, you're reading the book, you're doing the thing, you're, or you, you think you're doing your best. But then how do you make sure that you don't go back when you feel like, and I know that we retreat when we feel unsafe, but you've done a great deal of work on that and you just keep pushing yourself a little further, a little further and getting more confidence in yourself and trusting yourself more. So anything you can offer me to like, okay, this is what I need to do next, or how do I identify what I need to do next while not retrieving? I don't know if that makes sense. No, no, no. It makes perfect sense. And, and here's why it makes uh, incredible sense. And I'm glad you shared it. A lot of workshops like this and a lot of conversation like these are often very short lived because the vibration and the way in which we've discussed and interacted with each other, which is full of love, thanks to Aaron's comments and yours, uh, and all of the love I've gotten in, in, in the chat room, th this is, I am merely a reflection of what's in this conversation. I am not the conversation. I'm just one of many in the conversation because it takes two to tango. So please know that the compliment is not owned by me, but it's owned by you all. But, and I want you to write this down, Milagros, because I know what you do for a living. And it's important because the work you do is noble. What you do for people is noble. Y'all ready for this? Transformation is not a natural phenomenon. Transforming who you are or transforming what you know, transforming what you're up to, transforming how you view the world and what you're up to, giving up something, transcending something, unlearning something and learning anew. These are all, all very difficult tasks transformation is not a sustainable phenomenon and it's not natural evolution is but not a transformation because transformation takes work it takes work for you to generate transformation daily now you've got to ask the real question which is what would it take to support my transformation in action because i really am a transformation in action 
Want to know why I'm relit? Because of all of you. So doing this relights up my fire to say, hey, let's all meet in New York and do this workshop with all my science and technology at my disposal. We're going to have a blast, right? That's really cool. But why I'm telling you this is because the way to, in fact, support your transformation, your cause, your mission, your motivation, your inspiration, like the things that keep you going has got to be an external source. It is near impossible for you to be in your peak state and at peak performance levels on your own and by yourself. Because some of the greatest performers of mind and of sport and of money have support groups, have people, have advisors, mentors, coaches, advisors, managers. I'm a manager and advisor to many. Just today, I was advising one of my oldest clients, a 92-year-old billionaire named Frank Stronick. Billionaire, the largest auto part manufacturer in the history of auto parts, who's now retired and he's moved on his way. He's called the Magna Man. But why I'm telling you that is not to impress you, but to impress upon you is like Richard. And he says it in his Aust Austrian accent, Richard, I need accountability because if left to my own devices, I just rest my laurels on my billions of millions of monies. This is what he tells me. I'm like, Frank, you're 92 years old. Like, retire, man. He's like, why? I feel great. But why don't you and I, every week, get together? You keep me to the standard, and which makes me feel good about myself yet again. Even a billionaire at 92 who's had it all wants to be held to account. To what? Not to things to do, Milagros, but to a way of life, a standard of being, a perspective to achieve, a vision to be fulfilled. So, one more time, transformation is not sustainable. In order to sustain it, you must rely upon outside sources and preferably ones that do not have a vested interest in you, do not love you, do not know you. If they do, they too will need to be supported. That's why a great life coach or a partner in the process of transforming any part of your life is not your wife nor your husband. You both need to be supported if you're in a relationship here. So for you, Milagros, for me, I get held to account to three things. Here it comes. One is I create a massive vision for myself every year. What would blow my mind if I achieve even a part of whatever this plan is? That's one. So I have a master plan for the year. Two, two, I then mobilize people around me to support me in fulfilling that plan. I have approximately three real major businesses rolling that need support groups in each. So I need to have people around me. You all can start with one. You all can start with one. And even if it's about being a great influencer or someone on social media or someone just with your clients or just a great parent. But the third, this is the most important one. You've got to stick to an accountability structure. You've got to grow, as the Italians would say, the Corleones, to be able to see yourself for what it is, to see how quick you will slip and slide and slither your way out of success every week. You will find excuses, reasons not to show up. I, I lost my voice. I, I thought today, tomorrow. You will find every stupid excuse in the book to not show up and simply say, I knew I was going to do this. I failed to do that. Here's when I'm going to repromise it because we're all slippery. All of us wish to return to our default position, which is small, shrunk, stuck, and small. Why? Because that survives. It survives. I'm wearing a hat, not because of my brand, but because I didn't comb my hair. That's the truth. And that's okay, but I own it. It doesn't own me. And no, I won't return. No, I'm keeping my hat on. <laughs> so, Milagros, is that good? Let's you and I have another chat, though, okay? Because you know how much I love you and appreciate what you do in the world. So let me know how I can help you. Let me help support what it is that you're up to and how it should roll out there. Make sense? And listen, by the way, it's a great way to end, guys. I apologize for being uh, four minutes over time, but here's what I want to say, and I'll say three things. Uh, first, there's an additional breakthrough. I gave you two. Here's the third. Wealth is a measure of self-mastery, not merely attaining more. Remember, the first breakthrough was function of chemistry, not cash. Focus on your chemistry, not cash. Don't focus on that scoreboard. That shit will come. How you feel, how you occur, and what you attract is all that matters. The stuff will follow. 
Second is rich and poor are states, not status. No one cares about status no more. They really don't. And third is wealth is a measure of self-mastery, not merely attaining more. So if you want more, get those four. If you want more, get those four. Focus on the chemistry in the mind, not the field of play. And the more money, the more wealth, the more worth. If you feel like you need mentoring, if you want support, even if you want to get access to some of my coaching tools, which are all digital, by the way, they're all digital. You can merely get them as a rich you student. So if you're already a coach, a mentor, or a trainer, and you feel like you need some coaching yourself, but feel like you may not be able to afford me or the time with me, you can get our digital tools. You can have me in your pocket. That sounds a bit weird. You can have me digitally at your disposal, at your fingertips. No, that sounds weird too. Well, you know what I'm saying. You can have me digitally and coaching you to keep you on track. So those tools built by my team, led by Ken, we've got those tools all digital. Go to the site, check it all out, test drive it if you want. I'm here to help because if I help you, we help everyone. If we can help everyone, maybe, just maybe, we can alter the trajectory of mankind for the greater of the good, not for the greater of the evil that we're all enduring. You guys be safe. You guys stay rich. Stay focused on what matters most to you no matter what. Cut no corners. Compromise never. Because at the end of the day, this is your life. One life to live. May it be your best one yet. You guys be great. You be good. Be a richer you. And know I love you.